You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a travel agent and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Good morning, World Tours. My name is Jamie. How can I help you? Good morning. I want some information on self-drive tours in the USA. Could you send me a brochure? Of course. Could I have your name, please? Andrea Brown. Thank you. And your address? Twenty-four Ardley Road. Can you spell that? A R D L E I G H Road. Postcode? B H five two O P. Thanks. And can I have your phone number? Is a mobile all right? Fine. It's O double seven eight six. Six four three, o nine one. Thank you. And can I ask you where you heard about World Tours from a friend, or did you see an advert somewhere? No, I read about you in the newspaper. Okay, I'll get the brochures and the post to you. But can I give you some information over the phone?、Uh, what kinds of things do you want to do on your holiday? I'm interested in going to California with my family. I've got two children, and we want to hire a car. Okay, we have a couple of self-drive tours there, visiting different places of interest in California. The first one begins in Los Angeles, and there's plenty of time to visit some of the theme parks there. Ah,、oh, that's something on my children's list, so I'd want to include that. <laughs> Good.、Uh, then you drive to San Francisco. From San Francisco, you can drive to Yosemite Park, where you spend a couple of nights. You can choose to stay in a lodge or on the campsite. I don't like the idea of staying in a tent. It'd be too hot. Right. And the tour ends in Las Vegas. Okay. The other trip we can arrange is slightly different. It starts in San Francisco, then you drive south to Cambria. Someone told me there's a really nice castle near Cambria. Will we go near that? Hurst Castle is on that road, so you could stop there. Good. I'd like to do that. Does this trip also go into the desert? No, it continues to Santa Monica, where most people like to stop and do some shopping. We have enough of that at home, so that doesn't interest us. <laughs> okay, well, you could go straight on to San Diego. That's good for beaches, isn't it? That's right. That's a good place to relax, and your children might like to visit the zoo before flying home. Now, I don't think so. We want some time for sunbathing and swimming. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten.
Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. So, how many days are the trips, and how much do they cost? The first one I told you about is a self-drive tour through California, which lasts twelve days and covers two thousand and twenty kilometers. The shortest journey is two hundred and six kilometers, and the longest is six hundred and thirty-two kilometers. The cost is five hundred and twenty-five pounds per person. That includes accommodation, car rental, and a flight, but no meals. Okay, and the other trip? That lasts nine days, but you spend only three days on the road. You cover about nine hundred and eighty kilometers altogether. So is that cheaper then? Yes, it's almost a hundred pounds cheaper. It's four hundred and twenty-nine pounds per person, which is a good deal. So that covers accommodation and car hire. What about flights? They aren't included, but these hotels offer dinner in the price. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'll be in touch when I've had a chance to look at the brochure. I'm pleased to help. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two, you will hear a talk on the radio about grass roofs. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to thirteen. And now it's straight into the eco hotspot for today's program. We are in fact going to look at an intriguing trend in recent years in the world of eco-friendly developments. There has been a constant stream of new green products coming onto the market for the environmentally conscious. A new departure, which I feel needs greater attention drawn to it. Is the increasing interest in grass roofs? Environmentalists sing the praises of grass roofs, as interest in sustainable ecological building has led to the greening of the rooftops of residential and commercial buildings around the world. And what does this type of roof consist of? Instead of tiles, which allow water to run off and create flash flooding. The roof has a waterproof underlay, which is laid over the roof deck. This waterproof layer is then covered with layers for insulation and drainage. Then, on top of the insulation and drainage layer, is added a final layer of soil or crushed stones for the plants and/or grass to grow on. The roof can be planted with wild flowers to add colour and life to your rooftop. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions fourteen to twenty. Now listen carefully 
and answer questions 14 to 20. As for the benefits of grass roofs, in spring and in summer they are very pretty as flowers spring into bloom. Moreover, in summer, grass roofs are of particular benefit in cities because they keep any building cool by reflecting the sun's rays. In winter, the grass roofs insulate the building, helping to prevent heat loss. The roofs require little maintenance and are better than any other roofing material. They encourage biodiversity by attracting bees and birds, and they absorb water runoff, which helps prevent flash flooding. In fact, the gravel layer retains 71% of the rainwater that falls, thus helping to prevent flash flooding. In winter, the brown soil is a bit more evident, which can look unattractive if the roofs are not tended carefully. But that is a price worth paying, and I would say that they come highly recommended by those who have them. If you compare grass roofs with tiles, the latter do certainly look very tidy, but at a price to the future of the planet. The main drawbacks of tiles, though, are the water runoff and the absorption of heat from the sun's rays in summer. So, if we are to save the planet from the ecological point of view, tiles do not come recommended. The only roof that I can think of which has similar ecological credentials to the grass roof is the thatched roof. Thatched roofs are good insulators and very attractive, but very pricey and not ideal for cities. How can we make more of our roofs green? That is, how can people be persuaded to install grass roofs? The World Green Roof Conference in Australia was a very good start. At a grass roots level, the best way to raise the profile of grass roofs is to make them trendy by highlighting them in fashionable magazines so that people begin to feel that they cannot do without them. But the idea I like best is holding competitions for the best designed grass roofs. Next week, Eco Hotspot is going to look at... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two university students discussing how they should prepare for a presentation they are to give. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi Kelly, how are you? Fine, thanks. Do you still have time to talk about our presentation? Yeah, for sure. We need to get going on this, don't we? Well, it's next Wednesday, so yes. thought it was Thursday. No, that's the other group. We're doing ours the day before. I've just seen Fiona. She's going to be a bit late, so shall we just get started? Yes, fine. We're definitely doing it on women in education, aren't we? I know we talked about women in politics, but are we going for education? Yes, that's right. Now, it's not too long, is it, the presentation? They said to keep it to about half an hour. Maybe we can sort out who's doing what today. 
Yes, good idea. One thing we do need to sort out is a projector and laptop. We're going to use PowerPoint or something like that for the tool, can't we? Yes. They said we could book a projector and laptop from technical services if we needed them, because it's not in the lecture theatre, is it? I know there's already one set up in there, but... No, the lecture theatre was booked. We're in the seminar room. Before you hear more of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK, so what's the next step? We need to work out who's doing what, don't we? Well, we all know the subject, seeing as our last essay was on this topic. Yes, but we can't just stand up and ramble on. <laughs> It'll need to be structured. I've got an idea. Fiona's essay was brilliant, wasn't it? Why don't we base the talk on that? We can always add bits here and there if we think it needs padding out anywhere. That's a good idea. Shall we ask her to get a copy of it for both of us? Yes, I'm sure she won't mind. We can always let everyone know at the start of the presentation that it's Fiona's work. But we don't want to just read it out. That'll be really boring. It's probably best to make notes from it so that we can improvise a bit on the day. Why don't we break the essay down into sections and the three of us can each take on one section? We can all make notes on our own part and add to it where we think it needs it. That way we can try to make it our own. Yes, I like it. So let's ask Fiona to start the talk off and bring it to a close. She can take on the introduction and conclusion. I know she divided the essay into the situation for women in the past and then compared it to how things are now. So why don't I take the bit on the past and you talk about the situation for women as it is now? OK. If we give ourselves till the weekend to work on it, we can get together on Saturday to see how it's looking. Now, what about the presentation itself? Someone will need to build that and find images. We don't just want to fill each slide with a load of text, do we? No, we don't. Before I forget, I can sort out the laptop and projector. I've got to go down to technical services to get them to have a look at my laptop. They reckon they can get it to run a bit faster. But the presentation, who's good with computers? Do you fancy having a go? I don't mind. But I'll wait until we've met up on Saturday just to make sure we've all got our notes. We'll need images, won't we? Shall we all search for our own to fit our section of the talk? Yes, and then if you and Fiona email them to me, I'll add them to the presentation. Right, that was easy, wasn't it? And look, here comes Fiona. Let's ask her about her essay. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk on the work of a printing department at a university. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I am here to give you a brief outline of the work of this new department. The Department of the Printed Word has a very short history, having been created just ten years ago. Some statistics to start with. The first intake of undergraduate students consisted of 20 students, which rose to 37 in the second year, and we now have about 50 in the first year, doing a wide range of courses full and part-time. We have a thriving research department, with 17 students on the taught MA course and 7 students doing research full-time. In all, we have 9 full-time lecturers and 16 part-time lecturers who work mainly but not exclusively in our evening department. Of the total student body, approximately 21% are from outside the country, a number which has been increasing steadily over recent years. Although students from overseas have to reach a minimum level of competence in English before they follow a course at the university, some may require remedial help with their English. And we can offer help through the student support services as part of the general assistance given to all students. For home students, both graduate and undergraduate, there are bursaries to help with travel and accommodation for which I would advise you to contact Mrs. Riley at the end of this session. Increasingly, we are forging external links with organisations in the publishing world, and we have been very fortunate in that we have received money to sponsor not just various students within the department, but also technicians and lecturers. Each year we hold a series of lectures which are given by external speakers in the world of printing and the media. The series of workshops that you see around you have been built thanks to a very generous donation which has allowed us to develop our facilities for bookbinding and restoration. Now, the main work of the department relates to teaching the mechanism of printing. And as most printing is now so highly technological, all our students have to be computer literate. For those of you who are interested in taking a module in this department from another department, and who feel that you may not have the necessary computer skills, don't let the technology put you off. We have a number of specialist technicians who can support and deliver crash programs in the computing technology required. As long as you can switch on the computer, you are halfway there. We have what can only be called state-of-the-art facilities, especially for those wishing to move into the publishing world working not just as printers, but also in editing, page design, layout and bookbinding. With the extensive facilities we have for book restoration, some of our former students are now employed as expert book restorers and conservationists, skills which were once almost dying out. In the display you will notice samples of work on book cover design, and, as well as having all the necessary computer programs for dealing with printing, we have some old printing presses. Despite being largely a modern department, we do have an increasing interest in research into the history of the printed word, ranging from early European to Chinese and Japanese printing techniques. We have, in fact, some very well-known experts on early printing in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. If this area appeals to you, you can talk to Dr. Fred Clare afterwards. From China, we're lucky to have as a visiting lecturer Dr. Yu, who is an authority on early Chinese manuscripts and printing machines. If you are thinking about doing a module with us, or you are interested in doing research after you have finished your first degree, the person to talk to is Professor Clarkson, who will be able to give you all the details. For postgraduate research, you should really be thinking about applying now, even though we are only in December, as the department now attracts large numbers of people, and we always have many applications for each research position. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
not a game, it's a red skin.